But I have to tell you, it is such a blessing, such an encouragement to see everyone that helps out and is involved and in making every little detail of the service happening that continues to uh, communicate, to greet one another, pray for one another, to give so that uh, we can continue to lift up the banner of Jesus Christ here in Victoria. You know, the devil, uh, the devil delights in an empty church house. And I just love disappointing the devil, you know. I just love preaching the word of God anyhow. And that's what we're going to plan to do tonight. Amen. And y'all pray for me, please, as uh, Brother Carter used to say. Amen. Y'all. Um, and uh, please uh, uh, pray for me because uh, this evening we have a very important message, a very serious message, a very encouraging message. And um, I can tell you one thing. I, can, I know the devil won't like this message. And so you need to pray for me, amen, that uh, I would uh, be able to practice what I preach and that I would also have the uh, clarity and the boldness and the power of God because not in the wisdom of men, the power of God to preach His Word faithfully. And so let's just bow together in prayer as we begin in our message this evening. Dear Father in heaven, I once again just want to thank you so much for loving us. God, that you would just, just care so much for poor, wretched sinners is beyond my comprehension. And Father, I thank you so much for being so patient, so forgiving, and so merciful to this poor soul. Lord, I want to thank you for Jesus Christ and his death on Calvary, his glorious resurrection, and Lord, the victory. Father, we pray that tonight as we gather here in your name, Lord, that you would truly be right there in our midst, Lord, wherever we your children are, Lord, in their homes, uh, Lord, uh, wherever they may listen. And Father, we pray that you would meet with us, that we would sense your comfort, your encouragement, would it be your conviction. And dear God, I pray for the power of God upon this message. Help me, O oh Lord, I pray. Hedge us in, protect us, we ask, and watch over us. We thank you so much for your wonderful goodness, Lord. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name, the may, name above all names. Amen. Well, we want to start off this evening by turning to Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22 in verse 31, Luke chapter 22, verse 31, I'd like to once again encourage you to turn there together with me in your Bible. We are continuing in our series on understanding God's plan. And, uh, you know, one of the key elements of fighting a successful battle is understanding your enemy. Uh, that is one of the key components why Napoleon was so successful. That is one of the key components what made uh, Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar, so successful. I mean, you name any great conqueror of days gone by, and the, one of the keys to their success was to know and study their enemy, but not just that, also to anticipate, to almost f be able to foretell the steps the enemy would take and thereby they were able to defeat him uh, before the enemy ever even got into the field. That is what we're trying to accomplish with the series and with what we're, we're going to talk about tonight. And I think uh, it uh, is good for us to once again be reminded and understand that we are in a spiritual battle. You know, the battle is not political. It's not, you know, Trudeau against uh, O'Toole. It's not Biden against Trump. It's not, you know, the West against the, the, the East or whatever. It's not uh, poor against rich. It's not uh, right against left or any of that sort. It is a spiritual battle. And there are spiritual forces at work right now in this world. They have been throughout all of history. And the series, I hope, has given us some of the tools and God's yardsticks, God's measure, measure sticks, to be able to identify what are Satan's, to Satan's tool throughout history and uh, what is he using right now to uh, accomplish uh, the, the destruction of God's good plans for our life. But here in Luke chapter 22, we see one of the many reasons why I believe we really need to not just put this on a historical level, uh, not just on a, on a somehow, well, world against God or something level, but on a very personal level. I want to, uh, all of us throughout this series to be reminded of that question, well, where do I fit in this battle? Where am I, God? It, where, where am I, Lord? Am I in your plan, God? 
or am I involved in the plan of the enemy right now? And, and so I believe uh, this is a very personal, uh, practical application. You know, we'd like to look at prophecy or at, at history in the past and just, whoa, put out all the sensation there and see the big principles behind at work. And that is fascinating. I love that stuff, guys. But if we neglect to apply that on a personal level, we really miss the boat. Because it's you and I that are personally in the battle that is going on. And in Luke chapter 22 there, I want to read verse 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And so in other words, we see here how Jesus Christ warns his close friend, his disciple Peter, and says, Peter, Satan is out to get you. Satan wants to cut you off, to chop you, uh, and, and to put you on the, on the ash heaps of history, so to speak, and um, to take you out of the game. And um, I've prayed for thee, though. I have prayed for you. And you know what? In the Gospel of John, we see how Jesus Christ goes on to say that, you know, He's not just praying for those 12 or, or rather 11 disciples that were there with Him in the room, that original context of this verse, but He's also, His prayer is also for those that will believe on Him through their word. Now, that's you and me. Did you know that Jesus Christ is praying for you right now? At this very moment. interceding on your behalf standing for you and with you in the gap and one thing that i want us to be encouraged with is that as we look at all the evil it can be very depressing and we we, we look and identify sin and that is important because if we are not willing to identify the tools of the enemy we are already defeated before the battle ever begins and so this is very important folks we have to do this uncomfortable work of identifying the tools of the enemy. But, if we, we need to be encouraged as we do that. We need to be reminded as we do that, that the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. Amen? Let me say this again. Your battle against the evil and the sin and the temptation and the, the lures to, to, um, to follow the agenda of the, the, the prince of the power of the air, of the, the, the God of this world, the battle against that force is not yours, not in your strength and your willpower. It is the Lord's. And Jesus Christ himself is praying for you. You get nothing else out of this message. I want you to hold on to that. As you go through the rest of the days of this week, as we move into your next month, I want you to be, remind yourself, thank you, Jesus, for praying for me today. God, I believe I can make it through for your glory, living for your pleasure. It is standing in the evil day, as Ephesians chapter 6 says, as we put on the the spiritual armor of God, because we have the Almighty Son of God standing in the gap praying for us. You know, I'm thankful I don't need a priest praying for me. I don't need a pastor praying for me, even though, of course, I appreciate when others pray for me. But, you know, I, I don't need Mary to stand in the gap for me. I have the Holy Son of God Himself. Wow. So let's call out the tools of the devil and, 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 and name the enemy by name, so to speak. Amen? And once again, let's remember, the battle is not against people. The battle is against the prince of the power of the seer. It's a spiritual battle against Satan, the enemy of God. And because he's the enemy of God, he's the enemy of all good, the enemy of everything holy and righteous, and he's the enemy of you and me, God's children. He's the enemy of life. And so in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, we see a key uh, to understanding the agenda of the devil. 
First John chapter 3, verse 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. Why would the Apostle John say this? Well, because there are apparently a lot that have been deceived. And you and I better not be among those. Do not be deceived, amen? Little children, let, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, God, is righteous. And then we see the contrast in verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for taking care of that rascal. Amen. And, and for destroying the works of the devil. And so, um, whenever we give in to sin, to breaking God's commandments, to violating that which is good, and committing that which is evil in the eyes of God, we are following the agenda of the, of the devil. He that committed sin is of the devil. And so let's not fool ourselves. Let's not de deceive ourselves into thinking, well, the devil made me do it. Well, who decided to follow the devil? Who decided that? <laughs> Amen. Well, I did. Mm -hmm. You see, the wonderful news is if you re read Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, is that as a child of God, as a truly born again Christian, you do have the power. You now do have the ability to say no. There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. We all go through the same stuff. But God is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. Amen? Now, we've been studying and looking at the plan of the devil for quite a while. And that is important because we've looked at this age, this, this, this dispensation, if you will, of sin ruling this world. And to a certain degree, this, this age continues to this day. Thankfully, God has given His response to the agenda of sin but we need to realize that sin reigns unto death without the law. That was the time right following after the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, or the plunge as I call it, amen? And so that was the time before the law was introduced through God's prophet Moses. Now, eh, that's why we need to understand and look at the plan of sin. And sin is the devil's plan. And we see that contrast very clearly there in Romans chapter 5 in verse 21. That as sin hath reigned unto death, so that's the devil's plan, even so grace reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And what a stark contrast that is between those two agendas, amen? And so no wonder they are contrary one to the other. And so we've Realize that we need to resist against Satan's agenda in our own personal life. Not just out there somewhere in the world. Not just out in society and the general morality of people and politics and all of that stuff. Which is important. But that's not using it as an excuse to be willing to see at our own life honestly. And um, we've looked at several different aspects of the devil's agenda that he has in your life and my life, that he has uh, tries to accomplish in the life of your family members, of your co-workers, of your friends, your neighbors, and that he has been uh, relatively successful, more or less, throughout the centuries, uh, implemented throughout human history. And so we've named some of those by name, those instances, those examples of the devil implementing that agenda. And the first one we've looked at is in regards to doubt. In other words, undermining God's trustworthiness. Yea, has God said, oh, if God would really be good, he wouldn't withhold those pleasures of sin from you. Could God really be good and allow this?
And throughout times, just as the Lord says in Mark chapter 4, Satan comes immediately and tries to take away the seed of the Word of God that is being sown in our hearts and that truth. And, uh, and always Satan is trying to undermine and make us doubt God's Word. And not just that, he, he doesn't just take the, tries to snatch the good seed away, he then also goes ahead and plants seeds that bring forth snares, in other words, weeds, that rather crowd out and destroy righteousness and truth in our hearts and lives and thinking. The enemy that sowed those snares is the devil, the Lord Jesus says in Matthew 13. And so let's not undermine, uh, uh, underestimate the power of doubt. Now that doesn't mean you can't ask honest questions, quite the opposite. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be thinking uh, critically and reasonably, but it does mean that there's great danger in questioning the goodness of God. And that we need to just acknowledge that it has been Satan's agenda of old to destroy the existence of God, the goodness of God, the holiness of God, the Word of God, the people of God, through doubt. Um, we've talked about this, so we've got to move on here because I, I want to finish off a major section this evening. Um, and I believe that we can quickly do that. We've looked at pride and all the different avenues that it, it, it expresses itself in our life. I mean, I'm elevating and exalting myself above that which is due. I'm uh, I, I really, it's, it's, it's an expression of selfishness, pride is. And, and so we've uh, you know, looked at anger and all sorts of different uh, issues with pride. And um, we need to remember there's constantly those things that we need to cast down, that we need to put in their proper place because they're trying to rise up against God. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so this is very, very important. Pride is really the rude sin of Satan himself. We've looked at rebellion. Rebellion, which talks about undermining any form of godly, God-ordained authority, any form of God-ordained order. Rebellion is what causes the spirit of anarchy. And wow, have we seen this recently as people just react in fear, as division and passions are being whipped up, as people are in anger and people are, are really afraid for their very existence. And people are just, just looking back in their, their digital echo chambers all the time and, and being confirmed constantly uh, in their hatred and division. And what do we find? The spread of anarchy. Now that is not from God. God is a God of order. And He has established an order that is in place not because God is patriarchal and just wants to you know, overlord everyone or exalt you know, some group in humanity above others. No. But God has organized things the way He has for our protection, for our blessing, for our benefit. Now, authority can, of course, rebel against God themselves, and God will hold that accountable. Make no mistake about it. Um, Let's move on to destruction. Destruction. And that is the last point we have left off with, where the devil is trying to uh, uh, eliminate anything that is good or holy through uh, uh, many different wicked devices. Wicked devices. And, uh, you know, I'm reminded of John chapter 10, verse 10, where the Lord Jesus says that the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And the thief is referring to is Satan. I am come that they might have a life, and that they might have it more abundantly. We've looked at several different things that Satan uses, tools to destroy anything that is good and holy in this world, throughout history, and in our life. 
So whenever those things seem to creep to the surface, whenever these things want to dominate our society, dominate our family, dominate our personal lives, we need to stand up against that, and we need to uh, engage in the spiritual, right? Spiritual, that's the emphasis, the spiritual fight against those evils. And so whether that is through addictions, all right, and there's many different kinds that we by no means have all listed here that might be liquor or smoking or or drug usage or abusage, you know, that goes from recreational addiction to medical addiction. And that's why I said doctors need to be very careful with that. They can easily destroy a good life. Um, uh, and then, of course, there's uh, hard drugs, as they're called, um, addictions. I mean, it really doesn't matter. The devil is just out any which way he can to destroy your life. Um, there's, of course, crime. And, you know, it, just look into the Ten Commandments, all right? And these things will easily uh, be identified. We have, whether it be fraud or robbery or theft, uh, vandalism, corruption, even tax fraud. God is against that. Well, I just don't agree how the government spends their money. That is not your, your responsibility. They will answer to God for that. But Jesus Christ commanded us to give that which is the Lord's to the Lord and to give that which is Caesar's, which is the government's to the government. Violence. There's no question that we can know that that is not from the Lord. Whether that is brutality, assault, murder, abortion, terrorism. I mean, when you watch those videos of uh, young teenagers just beating people bloody to a pulp, whether it's, a, it's an, an old senior or, or fellow classmate on the schoolyard. I mean, it's just outrageous to think that human beings will be able to commit such atrocities, and yet it is, it is uh, almost too natural for us in our sinful nature. And, and it uh, is an evidence of how successful Satan has been in our society, our families, and so forth, in his inroads. And, you know, really, none of these things should be controversial, honestly. And it's a sad day that they are. And yet we find, if we would take the time, and we have in many of these things, but I, I believe we, we need to move on and conclude this and, and get the big picture. Um, we, if we would take the time to look at these things in detail, um, there, there's clear biblical principles and Bible verses that instruct us in a, all of these matters, all right? Um, and if you've got questions, by all means, I'd love to go more into that. Immorality. All right, God has said the gift of our sexuality for a very specific purpose, and that is one man to be united with one woman for life. There's a good reason why they call that sort of a marriage bliss. Amen? And it's sad when sin... Uh, and, and, and Satan have destroyed that concept in our society. Now let me hasten to say, God is splendid in fixing broken lives. God is excellent in forgiving and restoring and in mending. But it's so much easier to avoid a lot of that hurt and destruction that a disobeying God's design brings. And... Um, whether that be through adultery, through fornication, through uh, divorce, through uh, pornography, through rape, incest, I mean, you name it. Anything that goes out of God's good, original intent and design. Um, I want to move on to the aspect of strive and division and, and, and where any breakdown of relationship. And so whether that is within a marriage, whether that is... Uh, within, you know, a parent and children, estranged family members. None of that glorifies God. None of that pleases the most holy one in heaven. And so we need to see where do these things come from. And the book of Proverbs gives us the truth, amen, as the Bible tends to do. <laughs> and uh, tells us that only by pride comes contention. Only by pride comes contention. And you know what? If somebody... Uh, approaches you with prideful words or attitudes or actions, it is still your prerogative to not react prideful back, to not respond pridefully and strive and have fightings and contentions back. Now, is that natural? Absolutely not. Is it always easy? By no means. Is it necessary? Is it possible? Absolutely. 
And I can guarantee you, it is the more blessed way to live. Um, there's so much more, folks, here. But I really need to move on for the sake of time. And so, once again, any questions, by all means, I'd love to. We could literally have a series on each of these points for weeks, amen? Because um, God's Word is so rich, full of practical wisdom. And so, once again, if this book is just some pie-in-the-sky theories and some prophecies for 100 years down the road, then well, what in the world, what good would it do to us? I believe this book is more up-to-date than the newspaper from tomorrow. <laughs> And so I believe we can and we ought to live this book each and every day of our life. On our own strength, on our own power. Remember, the battle is the Lord's. Amen? And so uh, we need to do it by yielding to Him and trusting in His power. The last point I want to address is lies. Lies. Different forms of deceit, of deception. And boy, is the devil good at that. Satan has been doing that ever since um, his first encounter with humanity right there in Genesis chapter 3. And we've looked at that. And um, there's different forms of lies that the devil uses, different forms of being uh, of de- de- us being deceived, um, and and of us deceiving ourselves. Some lies we're being told by others, and we pick up in life and start believing them, whether consciously or, or or not in a way that we don't notice it. And others we we deceive ourselves into. We tell them ourselves. And there's different kinds, and this is by no means. An exhaustive list, but we have the feelings of worthlessness. That's not from God. God never told you that you're no good. God never told you that you're without value. What did what is the truth of the word of God? That you're precious in the sight of God. So much so that Jesus Christ was for, for uh, willing to give up his own life to give up all the blessings of heaven so that you could be loved and accepted and forgiven by God. That is how valuable you are. And don't you let the devil and no one else in this world tell you otherwise. Amen? Feelings of invincibility, that's a little bit the opposite. Oh, well, God, bring it on. What are you going to do? I'm smart. I'm smarter than everyone in this world, smarter than the Word of God. And, uh, oh, I'm strong, I'm young, I'm invincible. I could take the pleasures of sin, no problem. And that that deceit of invincibility is is, I mean, you're you're setting yourself up for steep, steep fall. And the higher you think you're climbing, the deeper and the steeper and the faster you're going to crash down. Don't go down that road; it's not wise. Let God put you into the place, Amen. Well, what is that place? Humility, humbling yourself before God. And submitting to him uh, inferiority complex feelings that well i'm just um uh I, i'm just i'm just always you know no no good i'm 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 I, I can never measure up all of these different aspects are not how god wants us to think god's word teaches us that his grace is sufficient for you and for any task at hand that he has put in front of your hands And so we need to trust the grace and the enabling strength and the wisdom of God instead of looking at myself. Oh, if I look myself and I compare myself to the mountain that is ahead of me, goodness gracious. I just want to curl up in the fetal position (laughs) and cry. Oh, I am inferior. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, everybody tells me that I'm just so much worse. Well, don't believe them. Believe what God says about you. And that is, though your skins be red as scarlet, I will wash you whiter than snow, amen? Excuse me if I get excited about the truth. Because there's so many minds that are afflicted and hurting today. It breaks my heart. This is good news that millions of people all over the world need to hear. I wish to God they would, amen? Superiority complex. Once again, these things are all similar And uh, boy, don't you think that you're better than no one else, uh, than anybody else. I mean, racism is evil. Racism is from the devil, folks. No question about it. If there's anything in your world, whether it's your smarts, your wits, your looks, your success, your money, your, uh, your, I I, I don't care what it is. If there's anything that makes you you think that you're better than someone else, you're a fool. You're a fool. 
And you, you need to put on some reality glasses through the Word of God. Amen? Victim complex. Oh, everyone is always out to get me. I'm always being blamed. Oh, it's all my fault. I can never do anything good. Oh, it's, it's, I, I, everybody is always shaming me. Let's put on some truth to that. You know who's the only one who was guiltless and was made guilty and being blamed for everything indeed? Do you know who that was? Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who died for the sins of this world. He never was guilty of anything that he, he was being blamed for. And yet he died for the guilt, the shame, the sin of all of us. And so let's realize that God doesn't look at you as a victim. God looks at you as a victor. A victor. Somebody that is victorious. That is more than a conqueror. That is always triumphant in Christ Jesus. Amen? In Christ Jesus. And so realize that you're not a helpless victim of your situation and circumstances. God wants you to live in truth. And that is the way He sees you. And He will give you the victory. Uh, eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia, all of these different ones, you name them. Um, God wants you to look at your body the way God created it. And that is exactly He intended. That is perfect. You look the way you look because of how God wanted you to look. He is the one who allowed your DNA. Now, obviously, we affect that through our life choices. But ultimately, you have to understand that your bodies is the Lord's. Oh, there's so much more. So many other mental, emotional afflictions that, that, that torment so many, many that are rooted in lies and deceits. And word of God, we would take the truth of the word of God and, and everyone would be set free from that. We got to move on though. Um, we have materialism and greed, amen? Materialism and greed. I quickly want to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want you to, to hang in here. We're almost done. And then we're going to turn to one passage of Scripture that will wrap this up in three simple practical steps, all right? And I will teach you what the Bible shows us, how we get into all of these troubles. There's three steps of how we get into these troubles. And so we can basically reverse them, and that will teach us how we can get out of them or keep avoiding getting into those sins and the agenda of Satan that is out to destroy us to begin with, all right? So hang in there. We're almost done. In regards to greed, materialism, you know, those things that, that, that fuel a lot of our ambition, a lot of our economy, and that, you know, is always, capitalism is always blamed for that, right? Oh, it's just everybody out for their own selfish greed. And um, uh, I think uh, that understanding is, is, is a bit faulty because, really, this is just our nature, selfishness, greed. And um, it, is so, it is so easy to trust in materialism. And first, uh, Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, the Bible warns us of that. That kind of attitude is not biblical. It says, but they that be rich fall into temptation and a snare. It's not a wise goal in life to become rich. That's not how God measures success. Now, you've been blessed. Praise the Lord. Enjoy that. But make sure you don't forget your maker and the one who given you all this uh, these things. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some covered it after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, we do not need an illustration for that. We don't need a picture for that. This is pretty graphic. There's not, not much more that we need to say to that, do we? Fame, fortune, and fornication. That is the formula that Satan is trying to get you. Look with me there in 1 John, 1 John chapter 2. The first letter to, by the apostle John in chapter 2, verse 16. That is 
where we get this formula from. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Notice here, we have the lust of the flesh. We have the lust of the eyes, and we have the pride of life. The pride of life is the fame. The, um, excuse me, the lust of the eyes is the fortune. Excuse me, is the fornication. And then the lust of the flesh is the for, the the fortune man i gotta get this right all right just remember fame fortune fornication those three areas whether it be through power popularity or whether it be through uh lust uh whether uh, you know of, of of sexual or other natures or whether it be through uh material possessions through money through success those three are the main areas that satan will try to 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 Attach himself to the natural tendencies of your nature and destroy your life. He's been doing this as we look throughout history for centuries. That is why wars are being fought. That is why crime is happening. That is why there is domestic violence. That is why there is uh, rape and, and all of these terrible evils. They all root back to those three main tendencies of our sinful, rebellious against God nature. And that is that we, we are allured by the evils of fame, fortune, and fornication. And through any one of these channels, whichever one he can find a weakness in your life, Satan will try to knock you down, destroy your life. And with that, defeat God's good plans. God's plans to give you joy and blessing an eternal glory in your life. He is destroying those plans. Don't let him do it. Don't let him do it. Amen. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The Apostle Peter teaches us. Or, or James actually. And um, so let's uh, move on to the last aspect I want to look at once again. Uh, in the book of 1 Timothy. This time in chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Living for pleasure, living for pleasure, and, and earthly vanity. Uh, in other words, things that are not in and of themselves evil or sinful or destructive, but if they become our idol, if they become what our life revolves around, they're just a waste. They're just, just vanity. And they, they, they train ourselves and our bodies to make us addicted to the pleasures they afford us. And soon enough, we will ignore the disciplines of living a godly, God-pleasing life and rather just revolve those things around, uh, whether it be pleasure uh, or just vain things. For example, there, I know people who are, who are or have been addicted to, to fitness, to sport, to working out. They told me themselves that those things can become addictive. Now, God is for us to have a healthy lifestyle, all right? There is some profit in bodily exercise, even the Bible says. But we need to have it in the right place. Um, dopamine addictions, all right? Adrenaline addictions. Uh, uh, in other words, anything that gives us a rush, that gives us a, a thrill, uh, that, that we give predominance in our life, that we give ourselves to. There is a fancy description for that sort of a, a lifestyle called hedonism. All right, and I won't bore you with the technical terms, but heathenism, in essence, basically is somebody who's given themselves to a lifestyle to, to, to get as much, squeeze as much pleasure as possible out of life, because what else is there to live for? In 1 Timothy chapter 5, there in verse 6, warns us in the context there is of those in, in need and a, and a widow and so forth, but it says there, in verse 6, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. There's very little potential left for spiritual life, for godliness, for the blessings of righteousness if we've given ourselves at, to worshiping at the feet 
of worldly fleeting pleasures. Now, God wants you to enjoy life. He gives us richly all things to enjoy, all right? That's Bible too. But boy, we better not get that out of balance. We better not get that out of that control, that discipline. And so in uh, closing tonight, I want to once, once again mention those uh, five things. Doubt, pride, rebellion, destruction, and lies. And lastly, I want us to turn to Psalm chapter 1. And that's what we're going to close uh, off with this evening. Psalm chapter 1, all right? And so this is very important. Please make sure you get this. This is, can save you a lot of hurt and pain and destruction in life. Because remember, that's what God's is out, uh, God, that is what God's enemy is out for. He wants to just ruin you. He just wants to destroy your life. And he is exceedingly skillful at it too. Now, he won't put that up on the front sign right away. He'll deceive you. He'll make that poison look really, really good. But it's still a fruit that bites back. You know, just like that, that fruit that, that Eve took and that Adam took and bit. It was not them getting control. It was their sin getting control of them. And ever since, sin has been biting back, so to speak. And the sting of death has been out to destroy us. Thankfully, Jesus Christ has the victory over it. And so there in Psalm chapter 1, I want us to just notice this breakdown of those three steps uh, of our development of destructive habits. All right? That slippery slope down into that hurt and danger. Notice verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, as leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper let me ask you this what do you delight in what is your delight what gives you the most pleasure verse 4 the ungodly the ungodly are not so but they're like the chaff which the wind driveth away you know the chaff is basically the the the, the light uh, rubbish that comes off of the grain and everything and it just just whoosh, is being blown away by every little turbulence and vent. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment of sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You don't want to be among those whose life is withering away. Whose spiritual strength is being zapped and destroyed and who being dragged down into a life of destruction so but there's three steps that we take on our way down that path and i think we see those very powerfully summarized in verse one blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly notice the first thing here that we see is the walking uh, the walking I believe that is where we start to get involved in all sorts of different distractions. Things that at first don't seem to be so terrible at all. Distractions. Whether that is social media, which can be very addictive. Whether that is uh, ungodly music. All sorts of things by which we're being lulled into and made comfortable to hang around the influence of ungodly thinking ungodly motives and ungodly behaviors until they do not bother us anymore until they don't even seem ungodly to us the walking just just hanging around just 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 getting to know those ideas of sin then we see the standing the standing notice walk is not in the counsel of the ungodly that's the one who, who just, just interchanges with the ideas of sin. The second thing is, standeth in the way of sinners. 
or it's now we're not just walking along and going for a little stroll together. Now we're actually hanging around. We're standing in the group with Sim. We're hanging out. We're, 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 we're starting to become more, more and more part of the clique. And we find that we're starting to not just being distracted, not just once in a while interchanging with the ideas of ungodliness and being distracted by them from walking with the Lord. Now we're starting to use it as an escape. We're starting to, to hang out of, of with ungodliness and sin more and more and more and engaging actively in Satan's agenda in our life. And that can easily happen through movies and TVs that we can get addicted to even. There's people who are addicted to YouTube or Netflix or you name it. Um, Amazon, Prime, and all of these different things. There's video games that can just start as, just as a, as a harmless distraction end up becoming more and more of an escape from a reality of life that is just not in sweet communion with the Lord anymore. Fantasy genres, science fiction, all of these things that just take us away from the things and the thoughts of God and of a reality of our life for which we will have to give um, in, in account and answered uh, for all eternity before Almighty God. Uh, anything that takes us away from the harshness of the reality that we live in a, lie, in, a, in a world that is surrounding us with lies and with sin and that is going to hell uh, 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 very fast and that only you and I can reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we want to escape from that. We rather want to stand and hang around the group of sin. And then... We start sitting there. We're permanently getting comfortable. We've not just, we would start out just, just, just walking along for, for a little part of the way every once in a while. Oh, we're just, we're just, we're just standing here. We're hanging out. You know, it's, I'm not part of that. I'm, I'm just standing here. I'm just consuming it, taking it in. But I'm not actually actively engaging that. No, 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 no. It's just pixels. It's just fantasy. And we're being deceived by the real danger. And then lastly, we see the sitting. And that's when we are part of the group. We're permanently getting comfortable in the circle of sin. We're actively delighting in ungodliness and those things that Satan wants to use his tools to destroy us. And we're now involved in participation. We're now participating. And we're actively engaging with ungodly influences, ungodly friendships and relationships, we're actively, uh, frequently uh, uh, visiting ungodly places, places that cause us to sin, and we're developing a hardened heart. Oh, but it all started out just, just oh, it was just a movie. Oh, it was just a game. It was just a fantasy. Oh, I would never do this in real. Oh, I, 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 I was just, just hearing about it. I was just engaged in it. It, it, it. Just watching. Oh, let's not be deceived. Oh, it starts out by walking. So harmless, seemingly. Oh, and then oh, I'm just standing around here. I'm not actually doing it. And then before we know what the next step down the slippery slope is to be part and part of the evil games of Satan. Do not be deceived. Believe me, you want to have the blessings of God on your life. You want to be among those righteous, those godly, that, that, that live like that tree planted by the rivers of water. Amen? Amen full of bliss and blessing and fruitfulness. And uh, Satan, though, wants you to be like that shaft that's driven a, a, a around by every uh, voice of wind. He wants to sift you like weed. But Jesus Christ, his plan is to hinder that, to protect you, to prevent that. Will you let him? Will you follow his agenda, yield to his plan and desires for your life? Or am I going to become sooner or later part and parcel of Satan's tools of destruction uh, against all ungodliness in this world. Jesus Christ is praying for you right now. Jesus Christ will be praying for you tomorrow morning. How are you going to respond? Who are you going to yield to? Amen. Let's just bow our heads, close our eyes. If you would with me, please, here in prayer this evening. All starts by just walking. Then it goes into standing before you know it. You're part of the group and sitting. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. 
as the Lord knocks on your heart's door tonight, what is your response going to be? Are you going to yield to his plan and her, his agenda of righteousness? Or am I going to allow the devil to lure and deceive me with that short-lived temporary pleasures of sin for a season to follow his destructive agenda? Now is the time to make that choice. It is a spiritual battle. Let's fight it with spiritual means. Allow God to fight the battle for you. Delight in the law of the Lord day and night. And you'll follow God's agenda. Let me ask you this. Maybe you're not even sure which side of this epic battle throughout the ages your life is on. Do you truly know that you are on the Lord's side? Do you truly know that you've been forgiven of all of your sins and that you're a child of God, not through anything that you've done, but through just the mercy of Jesus Christ? Have you received, accepted for you yourself personally his payment for your sin and guilt upon the cross of Calvary. If not, right now is the best time to do that. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Father in heaven, I want to praise you so much that you're so eager to forgive. God, I want to thank you so much that you're a good and righteous God, Lord, that wants only our best. And Father, I pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ against the agenda of destruction and sin and deceit of Satan and the life in each and every person in our church and our community. God, we pray that you would truly destroy the works of Satan as you have of old. And Lord, that you would have the victory in each and every one of our lives. Father, we pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Please do not leave. We are, even though the live stream will end here in a minute, we do want to continue together and join and unite in prayer together. Uh, so please uh, just click on that Zoom link and join us in praying together this evening. All right, and we'll just set this up here within a minute or so. God bless you.